Hey friends, it's been a while. I've been neglecting the old YouTube channel. Uh, my excuse is I've been busy, it's been the holidays, I've been traveling, uh, and I've been fussing over spiders. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is more about spiders. It's true, my spider obsession continues unabated. Anyway, so what have I been up to? Well, we had Christmas. I got Christmas presents. My wife got me nothing but books. And guess what? All the books are about spiders. I, I think that means my, my mania is getting a little obvious. But anyway, yes, so I've got spider books. The other thing that's happened is that um, I had some frustrating moments with rearing some egg cases. But that seems to have resolved itself now, and I've got some new baby spiders I can show you. So that's the first thing I'll do, is let's take a look at some baby spiders for a moment. Here's a baby from the new clutch. Isn't he adorable? Or she? Can't tell at this age. But it's a lovely young spider. It's about, it's about nine days old. That is nine days after the, after the egg was fertilized. Um, so it's a post embryo. I expect in the next day or so it's going to be, it's going to molt and enter the first instar, and then maybe another day or two after that into the second instar. But look, they're waving to you. Aren't they gorgeous? So that's a success. But wait, I know what you're saying now. How can I bear so much excitement? We've got all these little spiderlings emerging very soon. Well, there's even more to talk about, because I went in the lab this morning, and guess what I discovered? And that is yet another egg sac. So they're coming out thick and fast now. This is the proud mother. Look at her. I couldn't hold the camera still, but uh, she's looking out at us. And the nice thing I found was she's sitting on top of this gigantic egg sac. So, yeah, I've got another one to play with. I'm going to let her just nestle with it for another day or so, and then I'm going to separate them out and put the egg sac in a, in a new dish all by itself. And we'll see what comes out of them in about, oh, less than two weeks. But that's promising. We've got more on the way. Oh, wait. The title of this video says something about spider evolution, so I guess I need to follow through and tell you something about spider evolution. Um, there was a very cool fossil revealed recently in the pages of Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, and I just wanted to show it off a little bit. It's, it's a transitional form, a transition between ancient arachnids and modern spiders, even though no modern spiders are actually descended from it. I know that's a tough concept for creationists to grasp, but there it is. So I'm going to describe this fossil, but before I do that, I have to give you a little bit of taxonomic background. Let's start with the class Arachnida. Spider is not synonymous with arachnid. Arachnids are all eight-legged arthropods with usually two distinct body regions, but the various orders have differing specializations. The scorpions, for instance, have evolved grasping pedipalps with claws and an elongate tail that terminates in a venomous stinger. Mites and ticks tend to be small parasites that suck up plant sap or animal blood, but also have incredibly elaborate life cycles. Arachnids are the second most successful animal class after the insects. There are over a million insect species and over a hundred thousand arachnid species, the most after the insects. There are estimated to be 25 million tons of spiders on the planet, and they consume about 500 million tons of insects every year. In terms of multicellular animals, this might just be the planet of the insects, but the spiders are in second place and trying harder. Let's just focus on what makes spiders unique, though. One feature is an absence. While some of their colleagues in the class Arachnida have long tails, as we see in scorpions and whip scorpions and whip spiders, modern spiders have no such elaborations on their abdomens. These are called flagella, unfortunately. Biologists too often slap the same label, flagellum, on structures that look whip-like, but are not at all homologous. These structures have nothing at all to do with the flagellum of bacteria or eukaryotic cells. True spiders have discarded this structure and typically have rounded abdomens. They've also added something. Silk production. This is a photo of the abdominal cuticle of an ancient proto-spider, 
Atricopus from the Devonian. It's covered with hairs called cidae, as is typical of arthropods, but these hairs are called spigots because they can secrete silk, some of which is also preserved in this fossil. Silk is one of the primary signs that you're dealing with a spider. If there is any secret to the success of the spider clade, it's the universal production of this versatile webbing. A Devonian spider precursor wouldn't have had the fine control that modern spiders do, but having silk secreting spigots meant that it could probably line burrows with silk or, or build an egg sac or wrap up prey in a blanket of silk. Another innovation in modern spiders is the spinneret. A spinneret is basically a small turret with multiple spigots mounted on it. The spinneret itself is homologous to an arthropod leg, and it seems to have evolved via a reactivation of a suppressed program for abdominal limbs. It's a mobile extension that allows for more precise control of placement of webbing. As an aside, I have to mention that spiders do not thwip. You may have gotten the idea from Spider-Man comics that spiders eject strings of silk long distances, and a spinneret would be a kind of web cannon. It is not. Spiders can't squirt silk at all. They can use a spinneret to dab silk on a spot where it sticks, and then they walk away, leaving a trail behind them. Or they can use their legs to deftly pull silk out of a spigot and weave it around a target. They are silk repositories, not silk squirters. So the beautiful, intricate cobwebs, funnel webs, and orb webs of modern spiders aren't produced by firing long strands of silk long distances like silly string. They're made by sp spiders daubing silk with their spinnerets and then traversing the web, leaving a line behind them. They also have the ability to make a variety of strands, rope-like fibers, delicate lines, fluffy, non-sticky cables, and adhesive strands, all with their cunning little spinnerets. So it's not just silk that's characteristic of spiders, but this anatomical correlate of silk production, the spinneret. So let's explore the fossil record of spiders. I'm not going to discuss all the traits of spiders, just the two I've mentioned. The presence or absence of a flagellum, and the presence or absence of spinnerets, to keep it simple. Modern spiders, the true spiders, are numerous with about 35,000 named species. There are a bit over 5,000 named mammals, for comparison. All spiders today lack a flagellum, but do have spinnerets. The oldest known proto-spider is called Atrocopus, from the Middle Devonian, about 380 million years ago. It has a flagellum, and it has silk spigots, but no spinnerets. If this was all we knew, you might make a prediction. More recent fossils will show a loss of the flagellum and the appearance of spinnerets. If we were really naive, we might even expect a gradual transformation of the lineage. The next fossil is perm arachne, which, as you might guess, was found in the Permian. It also lacks spinnerets and has a flagellum, Fantastic, it fits our simple model so far. These two characters in themselves mean that neither of these two animals are members of the order Aranea, or the true spiders. So they've been lumped into a different order, the ur Aranea, which means tailed spider. Okay, this one bugs me a bit, because given the sparseness of the fossil record for spiders, this looks like it could be a, a paraphyletic garbage bin. We'll have the true spiders, but all those other species that aren't part of the clade will we'll chuck into this artificial category for not spiders. I'm not a taxonomist, though, and in particular not an arachnid taxonomist, so I'll just give that one a bit of a side eye and accept the authority of the experts. But still, it looks like a pattern. Primitive spider ancestors had a flagellum, and the spinneret hasn't evolved yet. Except... Here's Idmon arachne. It's older than perm arachne, but missing a flagellum. So maybe some lineages lost the flagellum early? Our simple progressive picture of evolution hasn't been shot down just yet. Also, Idmon arachne does not have spinnerets, so at least we can still claim spinnerets might be a recent innovation. Okay, but here comes Paleothele a carboniferous spider that both lacks a flagellum and has spinnerets. This image is an X-ray CT scan of the fossil, and it definitely lacks the flagellum. 
and it does have a spinneret. It's actually a mesothel, which just means the spinneret is located in the middle of the abdomen rather than near the end, unlike most modern opisthothel spiders. These two key features of modern spiders arose the Paleozoic, and we've got fossils that mix and match different combinations of these traits of flagelli and spinnerets. Now along comes this most recent fossil, the one that prompted this whole video. It's called Chimerarachne, and it's from the Mesozoic. So it's got both a flagellum and spinnerets. It's kind of satisfying in a way because now we've got a complete set of all the permutations of two binary things. So it's got that going for it. But there is no tidy numerical progression. Flagella persisted for hundreds of millions of years in some lineages and were lost early in others. Spinnerets appeared relatively early in the spider evolution, but their absence persisted for hundreds of millions of years in other related lineages. Chimera arachne is a startling little animal, only a few centimeters long, but it's many-legged and bristly, and it's got elongate spinnerets, beautifully preserved in Burmese amber. Uh, but there's nothing quite like it today, especially with that long flagellar tail. What we're seeing here is an example of mosaic evolution, complicated by spotty sampling. Flagelli and spinnerets evolved independently of one another at different rates. There's nothing to necessarily couple the evolution of one to another. So in different species, we see different patterns of relative evolution of these structures. You have to let go of the idea that we're seeing a sequence of ancestors in these proto-spider fossils. We're instead looking at a random sampling of the diversity of arachnoforms in the distant past, and the lineal ancestor of modern species is almost certainly not represented here. This problem is compounded by the fact that arachnids were hugely successful clade in the Paleozoic, just as they are now. Imagine 35,000 species of arachnids back then, and I've shown you examples of five. There aren't a lot more that are known either, we're dazzled that we found this many representatives of these small, fragile animals in the fossil record. One thing that surprised me is that a phylogenetic analysis of Chimera arachne placed it with Atacopus and Perm arachne in the Ur Aranida. And the authors of the paper further argue that it supports the monophyly of the Ur Aranida. Now, I'm a little baffled by that, but again, I'm, I'm not a taxonomist. The problem is that would imply that spinnerets evolved independently in the Aranae, and in one known species of their sister clade, the Ur Aranata. And that would imply that spinnerets in the Aranea and the Ur Aranata are not, in fact, homologous structures. The developmental biologist in me squeaks in protest just a, just a little bit. There's only one way to answer this question, more fossils. So get to work, invertebrate paleontologists. I can't help you there. Okay, that's all for now. I, I Again, I apologize for pay, taking so long here. I will try to get back on schedule and produce a video every week. So I'll see you around.